Okay, we'll begin. Uh, I'm Earl Taylor, Chief Marketing Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, since 1961, nonprofit MSI has been the bridge between marketing theory and business practice. We fund research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted by our 70 plus corporate sponsors and disseminate results through members only events and a variety of publications. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another MSI for members by members webinar. This is one in a series of webinars on subjects related to MSI's current research priority topics. First, I'd like to point out that the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen, please use this feature to send through any questions you have for John during the presentation. We will gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. Also, John's slides as well as the entire webinar will be available for download on the MSI member website. Now, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. John Gerzema of BAV Consulting has kindly agreed to present today's webinar on the 21st Century Leader, a data-driven approach to understanding what society expects from leadership. John's a pioneer in the use of data to identify social change and help companies anticipate and adapt to new trends and demands. He's an author, speaker, and consultant. His books have appeared on bestseller lists in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Fast Company, and many other publications. He's a fellow at the Athena Center for Leadership Studies at Barnard College. He studies leadership, innovation, and social responsibility. As CEO of WPP's BAV Consulting, John oversees the largest study of consumers in the world. A frequent columnist, his articles were chosen among strategy and business best of the decade, and his TED Talks have been widely viewed. As an advisor for the UN Foundation's Girl Up campaign, his latest book, uh, the Attended Doctrine explores the rise of feminine competencies and their impact on leadership, policy, and progress. Tom Peters says the Attended Doctrine is a powerful book, extraordinary research, great storytelling, a message both timely and of monumental importance. And I think given the news of the recent days, it certainly is a timely topic looking at leadership strategies and how companies make decisions. So without further ado, I'd like to have uh, John begin the presentation. John? Thanks, Earl. I appreciate it, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, as Earl mentioned, we have been studying 21st century leadership and how uh, we are adapting in, in the new world. And so I'm going to briefly uh, talk about this sort of through a few stories, and then I'll get into some of the data that explores and unpacks sort of how we approach the project. But um, you know what I'll do? I'll start and, and tell you about a guy that I met in um, – in Shinomaki, Japan, and his name is Nagato Kimura, and he's the, on that photo in front of you. And he ran a fish cannery, and tragically, the cannery was destroyed uh, with the events of the hurricane and tsunami in Japan. And one of the things that happened is that this was, uh, we're all marketers hopefully on the call, and this was a famous delicacy, this um, brand called the Kinoya Company. Um, is a well-loved brand uh, in Japan. And they had a bunch of their customers, their fans of this brand, actually travel up to Ishinomaki because they learned that the cans, although all the labels had been wiped away, they started popping up in the sea and they were dotting the beaches all around the factory. And so ordinary customers in the public got involved and they, they went up, they spent three weeks collecting all the cans, cleaning them, and then they brought them back down to Tokyo and to other areas uh, to have them sold in an attempt to show support for the company and to also you know, help uh, the company rebuild its factory. And one of the really interesting things that happened is that they put the cans back on the store shelves, but they put them on bare because their labels had been washed away. And what happened next was, I think, kind of remarkable. Uh, Kumarasan told me that people started coming in to the stores and they would buy a can and then they would take a Sharpie or a magic marker and they would start to decorate these cans. And this became a huge phenomenon in Japan for several months. And what you see before him are little messages like, you know, we will survive, we will thrive. You see a, a patriotic reference to the flag. But what happened is, you know, ironically, a, a can of tuna fish sort of became this objective symbol for hope and recovery and they became known across uh, Japan as cans of hope. Um, 
another place sort of 5,000 miles away, but another island country, we met a really interesting guy, uh, or Bordeaux Johnson, and he, I guess the uh, way I describe him, he's just sort of the Gary Trudeau of Iceland. He is a, a satirist slash Lutheran minister who had been making fun of the government. So when the government uh, and the financial collapse happened, he had a lot of credibility and he was appointed uh, a constitutional committee member uh, of the new provisional government. And here you had a crisis of a different sort. You had a, a financial crisis that had basically ruined the country and the respect for government was, was nil. And so the first thing they decided to do was to create an open, participa participatory, inclusive environment. So they set up accounts on Twitter and on Facebook and on Tumblr and they started to ask citizens what type of constitution they would want in order to recover from this crisis. And the net effect was amazing. We followed them around through um, town halls and soccer stadiums as they gathered people to help crowdsource a draft of a new constitution. And I think what's interesting, kind of both of those stories, is that you have um, this sort of what could be described as a feminine response to crisis you know, one natural disaster, or another an economic crisis, but sort of in both instances, the human tendencies to show compassion, to show empathy, to show inclusiveness and community really became sort of the dominant themes and they, and they were catalysts for um, the eventual uh, recovery uh, in both situations. And we thought that was an apt metaphor and we began, uh, Michael D'Antonio, my co-author and I, um, began sort of exploring this concepts around, uh, around femininity and around leadership, but we, we actually started writing this book without any um, understanding of all of these, the power of these feminine values. Uh, we're two middle-aged guys with not too much hair, and uh, we were learning as we went along. And um, what we decided to do, though, is we, we started the book by going out and, and doing research, and we had a, a range of of open-ended questions and surveys, but we wanted to get a uh, nationally representative samples of, of a cross-section of the world. While, while a very difficult sort of a piece of research to, to sort of field, we um, decided to sort of pick these countries on the basis of varying economic development, cultural um, issues, um, cultural nuances rather, and we, we gathered this data from 64,000 people in 13 countries from Canada to Chile to Indonesia to Mexico. But um, we also went out and, in addition, uh, spent nearly three years interviewing leaders, diplomats, um, CEOs, startups, uh, interesting thinkers in STEM, basically trying to understand what was happening to leadership in the 21st century and what were the strategies that these leaders were using to sort of navigate uh, an open, social, and, and interdependent world. And I'll start a little bit with sort of the macro data, and you'll see on a macro level, this is a, a roll-up of all 13 nations. Um, and uh, by the way, on, a, on our website, all this data is available to be downloaded and cut by countries and targets, et cetera. But this is just for the sake of, of brevity at the moment. We'll look at some broad data here. So yeah, 13 countries, um, 64,000 people, and people are, are questioning whether life is going to be better for their children. They're, definitely concerned about too much power in the hands of large institutions and corporations. Um, this question of empathy, and I'm going to come up on, on it again a couple more times in the next half hour, but this empathy issue is a huge issue as people really question whether leaders care about their citizens today, and, and really they question society's basic fairness. And in, a, in the range of a lot of the open-ended interviews uh, questions, there were some interesting things that started to point some directions for us to explore further. And the first was this sort of, um, sort of global referendum, if you will, on masculinity. Um, this question uh, said, I'm dissatisfied with the conduct of men in my country. And the majority of people around the world felt that. But I thought what was really interesting is that the majority of men did too, especially in, uh, in cultures and in, in countries that you could kind of typically assume to be a little bit more masculine. Um, you know, it was interesting, you know, in Japan, you know, nearly 72% of Japanese men felt that they were dissatisfied with the conduct of men in my country. Um, what's interesting, and I thought quite humorous perhaps, is that Canadian men must be doing something right. They had the lowest levels of dissatisfaction. And uh, as a researcher, 
uh, when I look to China, the, the delicate nature of some of these questions uh, probably draw down response rates. But when you look at it across the, the range, we thought that there were some interesting things that, that were happening there. Um, but the other thing that was interesting to us was um, this question, two-thirds of people thought the world would be a better place if men thought more like women, uh, nearly equal amounts of, of millennials. And when we pull out the millennial data and uh, really look at it more carefully, you see a profound generation gap in, in really interestingly in many countries such as India, um, Indonesia, um, and others, Brazil, where millennials have far more progressive views about women and, and the role of, of feminine values in their lives, even more so than women over 50 in their same countries and cultures. So millennials definitely are driving this trend. Um, and I guess what we started to, to get interested in this is if this was really the case, if there was something here with a desire for, for more uh, feminine values, and this, again, as we did this research, this was um, you know, a year and a half before Lean In came out, and this has become sort of a dominant uh, discourse today. Um, we got interested in this, and, and we said, well, let's go back into the research and, and conduct a study. So this is what we did. We um, studied a, a range of different um, psychology papers, uh, papers on feminism, masculinity, and gender. And we are not professing that we are gender experts, uh, far from it. But what we tried to do is look at and collect a range of, of 125 different human traits. And what we did is we asked 32,000 people or half a sample in each of those countries to classify those traits. And just for demonstrative purposes, this is an actual data, but we said, you know what, take all these traits and tell us whether or not you think they're more masculine, more feminine, or, or, or sort of neither. And so that was one half of the sample. And then on the other half of the sample, we asked those same, uh, the other half, uh, to rate these same traits on leadership and success and morality, happiness, et cetera. But in this time, there was no mention whatsoever of gender. We simply asked them, you know, what are the qualities that we need to have more better modern leaders to solve the problems today, to be more effective in our careers and be happier in our lives? And it was really interesting, and I'll pull a couple of charts out here just to kind of get this going, but one of the things that we saw, and again, the R-squares get a little flat when you factor in China and Canada, because I'm rolling up all the data, they get really pronounced, uh, particularly when you go into uh, more developed countries. But overall, we sort of started to see that the essence of the modern leader is more feminine. So, you know, what I guess surprised me first and foremost was that the masculine qualities that were least correlated with the ideal modern leader were things like aggression, pride, and independence. And, you know, that kind of sounds like um, the typical sort of archetype of the go-go CEO, right? It's my way or the highway and this command and control leader. And people were sort of rejecting that. And instead, what they were looking for were leaders that were more expressive. Expressive in the context, and we, we learned this later in our qualitative, you know, how do you take your vision for your, your business or for your country or your leadership style and make that personal and intimate and relatable to people? Um, planning for the future was important. Reason, um, loyalty, flexibility, patience, collaboration, um, uh, passion uh, and, and the sense of openness, and then this selflessness, and again, you see this word empathy kind of came back time and time again. And it got us interested that, um, you know, that there might be something here as we start to think about what people are really looking for, what they think is missing. So the other thing that we saw in our data was that people widely believed that we're all human, right, that we all have these qualities, but the feminine side of our consciousness in both men and women uh, was not fully being applied to, to being effective leaders in the modern environment, and that was there at our disposal. And one of the guys that, that we interviewed then as we kind of went out into the world that kind of really, I, I guess, sort of crystallized uh, the Athena doctrine for us was the, the president of Israel, Shimon Peres. And this is Michael and I uh, in his office uh, in Jerusalem, and he said something to me I'll never forget. He said, we are in a new world with many old minds. He said, we're in a new world with many old minds. And, and I asked him to sort of elaborate, and he had just come back from spending time with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg in, at Facebook, and he was talking about the impact of social media and dictatorship and how leaders were going to need to be open and 
the, the resulting effect on that could ha have a huge liberating effect. But really what he was talking about, I think, were, were these skills. And that's what we saw as we traveled around the world, that as we looked at our quantitative uh, data as well as the qualitative insights from all of our interviews, we kind of came back with these sort of 10 characteristics as sort of essence of a benchmark of, of an ideal, more uh, Athena leader for the 21st century. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to have every one of these, but really what we sort of argue in the book is how do you take your own skills and bring your whole self into a challenge by leveraging a few of these traits if you have them inside you and you don't show that side. And at the same time, how do we in organizations and in teams really draw these out to balance our teams and to celebrate these in, in our colleagues? So we'll take a few of these and sort of unpack them. And I think one of the ones that's a little um, surprising might be vulnerability. Like how, how could you be a vulnerable leader? And here's an example of one. Uh, this is a guy that we met in Berlin, Germany. His name is Dr. Ayad Madish. And he um, told me that the genesis of his startup came from his uh, failures as a researcher at Harvard. Um, he's got a, a PhD in virology, and he kind of kept going around asking his colleagues for help. And what was interesting, he was trying to be practical. He was just trying to shortcut um, time on his experiments. But what he got back from his colleagues was is that he looked weak. And they said, you know, you're the guy. You should have all the answers. You've got the PhD. And he, he thought that, this, that there was way too much me rather than we in science. So he set up researchgate.org, and it's the first Facebook for scientists. And it's remarkable what he's accomplished. And I think the numbers now are he now has 3 million scientists collaborating on nearly a million different projects. And at the time, I asked him, I, I said, you know, Dr. Mansch, what do you want to do with this? And he said, I want to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. And I want the credits to flow like at the end of a, of a, of a movie. And I think what was so interesting about what he's done is that he showed his weakness. He showed his vulnerability. He, he admitted what he didn't know, and that attracted a lot of other people around him because they then had the invitation to kind of come in and collaborate and help. And I think that's a really interesting sort of aspect for a leader is how do you, you know, manage your own, balance your own talents against your own weaknesses, and are you open enough to show that side of yourself? and you might actually create some great results. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we met the highest ranking woman um, in the armed forces anywhere on the planet. This is Major General Orna Barbabai. Um, she is um, a general in the Israeli Defense Force in Tel Aviv. And I asked her how she approached military strategy, and she said, as a mother, I, I was quite surprised by that, but what she ultimately was saying was that um, mothers have this unique characteristic to anticipate conflict and to sort of um, game out the, the likely outcomes, both negative and positive, mostly negative. And we had this humorous exchange, but what she got serious and told me was that she was having a significant security challenge at the checkpoints. And what she realized is that the checkpoints were filled with only male soldiers, and there was a lack of esteem for uh, the Arab partners uh, workers that were coming in and out of Israel every day. And so what she did is she created two programs. Number one, she created com um, commendations, basically medals for soldiers who de-escalated conflict, who created peace by restoring esteem. And secondly, she put women at the checkpoints, including two of her daughters, to make this point. So just an interesting creative thinker to sort of applying an Athena solution to a problem. We were surprised to find uh, Athena values in politics. Uh, while they may not be in our nation's capital at the moment, they're in some progressive environments, clearly um, in Northern Europe. This is the Felisus. and I don't know if you guys have heard of the Felisus, but it's the uh, first shared embassy in the world. And this is Leo Riske, who's a cultural attache from Finland. But the Felisus is kind of less like an embassy. It's more like a university campus. And it houses uh, the embassies of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. And the whole idea for this 21st century model of diplomacy is not to be closed off, but to be open and porous and to sort of engage with the culture around you in a way to sort of pool your scale and, and create greater opportunities for policy, legislation, and economic development. Equally, um, 
I, I got to say that two of the favorite places that we spent time with were probably Kenya, which is an incredibly dynamic society. Um, and this is Bob Collymore. He's the CEO of Safaricom. And if you've um, heard of Safaricom uh, at all, you may know them through M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a text-based messaging platform that allows you to uh, send payments uh, via a very low-tech device, which is a, a, a cell phone through text. And it's incredible. This product now drives nearly 67% of the Kenyan economy. It's been an ingenious solution that has enabled um, Safaricom to grow, but it's also allowed Kenya's economy to prosper. And what Bob has been doing with this is opening up this platform to allow all types of, of really ingenious new collaborative models to be developed. And one of the, the people that we interviewed, in addition to Bob, was setting up um, a way for poor farmers to afford crop insurance by taking a very low-tech weather vane installing that for $8 on their farm, and then having that measured by Safaricom, and the insurance companies could then text a message of repayment to uh, farmers to allow them to replant their crops. And today, uh, there are nearly 20,000 farmers participating in this program. So really interesting um, uh, elements going on there. Um, we spent also in uh, Stockholm in Sweden we met these two young guys. Uh, this is really a story about transparency. And uh, Jonas Vig and Mans Alder started a, a really interesting company called Bamboozer, which is live video platform for your phone that goes straight to your social media. So they thought they were building something that was about entertainment, but then they realized that they were the first startup to be shut down by the Egyptian government during the Arab Spring. And what happened was is that young people were into Hear Square broadcasting through their phones and basically demonstrating and broadcasting uh, the Arab Spring to the rest of the world through their platform. Um, one of the stories they told me when we sat down with them was that there was a young woman um, who had been taken into police custody and they feared for her safety. And so everyone broadcast the video of her going into the police station and it ricocheted around the Internet, became a, a trending topic on Reddit and on Twitter, and within 30 minutes she was released from the, the police station. And I think what I find remarkable is that these two young guys of very questionable hygiene, I can say that because I spent a few hours with them, uh, literally at that moment had more power than, than a government. And I think that's really what the Athena Doctrine and the leadership um, insights are really all about, is that the, we are moving from a, a command and control to a more open, collaborative environment. And so leaders need to sort of flatten out their leadership and think in a far more open, creative, and adaptive way. Um, the other aspect of leadership is that it's now coming from the bottom up rather than the top down. And uh, this is a young man named Kohi Fukuzaki, and Fukuzaki-san I was in his dorm room at Tokyo University where I interviewed him, and he talked about his reaction to the, the tragedies of, uh, of the earthquake and the tsunami. And one of the things that you may recall, like many government responses to crisis that aren't often well received by the public, that was the case in Japan. And he was particularly frustrated that there were so many uh, displaced people that didn't have housing. So he told me, he said, John, I decided to hack an Airbnb. And uh, what he meant is he, he got out his WordPress and he created a rudimentary website called roomdonor.jp. And on one side of the screen, he offered um, housing basically of people that had houses, uh, rooms to share. They could um, publicize those like a Craigslist. And then on the other side, people would broadcast where they were living and that they needed housing. What was incredible is that he moved 12,000 families in three weeks through his website. And what I want to really stress here again is that as leadership, we always think about that from, from the top down. And anyone who manages millennials or has a millennial in their household knows that that's not the case. And so any leader today has got to understand that, that solutions to problems uh, are going to be formed far more quickly and nuanced and isolated and that young people want to be empowered, they see themselves as leaders in their own right, and they're going to take that action. Um, another theme that we saw was um, 
the theme of building values into startup business models. And there was a young woman named Katie Moat, 25 years old, who enlisted an army of grandmas to sew handcrafted scarves and hats on Granny's Inc. Uh, it's grannysinc.co.uk. Um, it's a British startup and very popular with millennials. I, I guess I kind of describe their business models across between Etsy and AARP. Um, but this is Holly. We spent time with her in the, in the British countryside. And one of the great things about Granny Zinc is when you go onto their website, the first thing you do is you pick out your own granny. And then Holly or, or one of the other grannies will sew you a hat. And instead of sending it in some sort of generic Amazon or Zappos box, it comes in one of those fabulous packages you might remember as a kid that came from your grandma. And I think what's really fascinating about what Katie created is she understood that there was a void. You know, there were young millennials in London that were away from their families that wanted to have that connection. And very cleverly, her theme line for her company is, Granny's Inc., there's wisdom in the wool. We also spent time with Maria Ziv, and uh, she's the director of the Swedish Tourism Bureau. And um, she does research just like I do. And um, shockingly to her, uh, in a global survey, she found out that the top two things that people think about Sweden around the world are blonde people and ABBA. Now, that's kind of a, in research we call that sort of negative knowledge. Um, and what she did is she said, I've got to find a way to, to create the real portrait of what life in Sweden is all about. So if any of you guys are on Twitter, this is a great Twitter account to follow, but it's, it's called At Sweden. And what Maria did is she went to the Swedish government and she said, hey, can I have the Twitter account for the country? And basically the government handed it over, and each week one citizen tweets on behalf of the country. So talk about a big job. You know, you're almost the Chamber of Commerce for the entire country. So again, what she was trying to create is an open, sort of more realistic portrait that was inclusive and a crowdsource uh, solution to try to get to more authenticity. Um, empathy, again, you know, Dr. Joseph Coughlin, really interesting guy up at the MIT Age Lab, he's studying the effects on aging in uh, developing uh, in developed markets and the fact that we're going through this obviously huge baby boom uh, in an aging society. And he wanted to discover it through the lens of empathy. And his challenge was he had really young researchers and engineers, um, but they didn't really understand what it's like to be a senior citizen. So what he did is he created a product called AGNES, which stands for Age, Game, Now, Empathy System. Basically what it is is it's a, it's a device that kind of makes you look like a, a hockey goalie. You wear a heavy helmet that puts pressure on your joints and your neck. Your eyesight is dulled. Your hearing is dulled. Pressure is placed on your joints. And then these engineers and designers try to get in cars and drive them. They try to open up uh, products. They try to reach for um, items at grocery stores. They're basically studying ergonomics through the concept of full empathy, which is sort of living the experience of the customers they're meant to uh, um, observe. And I think this is a really interesting connection as marketers that we can think more closely about the connections to empathy and innovation, and not simply sort of passively observing uh, an environment for an opportunity or a market, but actually trying to really live it and experience it. Um, and then two more uh, quick talks, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close this by sharing you a, a couple of other observations more specifically in marketing. But you know, we, we interviewed um, over 125 people around the world, or 150 I guess, and I just pulled out a couple of the stories from the book. But you know, one of the real interesting theories and, and themes rather of, of the people that we met is that as Athena thinkers, they were taking their masculinity, their femininity, whether they were men or women, and they were putting their whole selves into a challenge. And often that yielded really creative solutions. Um, probably no more so than Sylvia Lolly. She has run a, a domestic um, shelter for women and children for many years in Lima. And she got so ticked off at the all-male police force at the time. They, um, after all, had turned a blind eye toward um, domestic abuse and the role of, of protecting women. 
So she said, screw it, I'm going to create my own all-private women's police force. And it was remarkable. Over five years of development, the women became so competent that they were integrated with the men and corruption dropped by 33% in Lima. So again, a really courageous thinker who was sort of thinking outside the box by bringing her whole self and her passions and her authentic beliefs into the workplace. And then, you know, a real interesting retailer um, who took a personal experience and really transformed the lives of many other people. Uh, this is Yamaguchi-san, and she's the creator of Mother House. She makes fine, high-quality handbags that you might be able to see behind her. And her story started out uh, in a pretty challenging, tough way. She was bullied very terribly as a child, uh, so much so that her parents had to take her out of school, and she was homeschooled. And it, while she was doing that, she started to realize that she had an interest in fashion, but she also didn't want to have anything happened to other people like what had happened to her. So she told me the story. She said, I wanted to go to fashion school and then I wanted to help people. So I, um, she said she went on to Yahoo and she typed in what's the poorest country in Asia and discovered that it was Bangladesh. And so she decided to go to fashion school there and then eventually with the help of Kickstarter and some money from her family and friends, she leased a factory with 100 illiterate workers. Uh, by the way, all of them were men. She was about 24 at the time, and she literally spent 18 months trying to teach these guys how to create handcrafted, high-quality, boutique um, luxury handbags for the Tokyo marketplace. Now, what I failed to mention is that these workers at the time were sewing sacks for grain and potatoes. So this was a big challenge. But what she did is she did two really interesting things. She um, gave them profit sharing, although there were no profits in the company, and she gave them name tags. And actually the third thing she did is in a really present fashion, she moved them out of very shoddy working conditions into safer conditions in the suburbs, which was a huge avoidance of the calamity that, that then happened in Bangladesh. And um, if you fast forward today, she has seven um, stores in Tokyo, she has a sustainable business model built on these values, and she pays double the average wage of workers in her sector. So uh, all these sort of dominant millennial-led, uh, often cases, uh, values are being built into these business models. They've got this feminine underpinning, but really what they're about is human compassion and really not segmenting or creating a secular device between profit and purpose. And she's definitely demonstrative of, of that. So I thought I might close real briefly before I open it up and ask for questions by talking a little bit about what we've done to evolve our thinking since the book. Um, I work with um, two researchers at Princeton, uh, Dr. Meredith Saden and David Paduya, and they worked with us to sort of devise an Athena metric. And what they did is they looked at um, a feminine and masculine scales by taking our attributes and characteristics that we uncovered in our survey um, by looking at the, the predominance of them being more feminine or more masculine. And basically they replicated that process for both the feminine and masculine um, attributes. And what they then did is sort of to look at against our BAV database, and as Earl mentioned, we have um, a database of over 50,000 brands in 50 countries and 75 metrics. and so. What we're looking at is um, sort of the association between those scales and what we call brand stature, which is um, energized differentiation, how different your brand is, as well as how relevant it is, and lastly, how much momentum it has. And then also uh, looking at stature and strength, which I've just explained uh, together, and then also looking at usage and preference. And then, um, we also kind of looked at the, the marginal effect of the masculine scale on, on the variables of interest and looked at those sort of same associations. And we just tended to see a larger staying power um, across the feminine values than the masculine values. And that really got borne out further when we went a little bit deeper into developing um, sort of rudimentary four different brand typologies uh, based on our feminine and masculine scales. So what we did is we kind of created an Athena and Apollo by looking at 
high feminine, high masculine, high feminine, low masculine, low feminine, high masculine, and low feminine, low masculine. And what we basically um, built in this typology assumption was if the brand is too low or on the feminine or masculine scale, it has a score below the median. If it's high, the brand has a score above the median. And then what, what they did is they assigned each brand to one of the four groups as defined above. And we thought, you know, just generally it was pretty interesting as you look at the green, which is the low feminine, low masculine, um, and the high feminine, high masculine in red, low feminine, high masculine in blue, and high feminine, low masculine, um, you start to see sort of this interesting trend where the input of feminine values are really important in brand stature and also in usage. And so, you know, that to us we thought was kind of interesting that, you know, surely there's going to be a role for strong masculine values uh, if you are the NFL or if you are John Deere tractors. But the extent to which you can bring your feminine side into your brand, um, whether it's dominant or whether it's complementary with the high masculine quotient, seems to suggest correlation um, that there may be greater ability to usage and preference. And anecdotally, I guess what I draw out of that is, you know, the, the ability for um, empathy and customer service, the ability for a brand to express um, compassion, uh, to create collaborative uh, relationships through brand experience. A lot of these things we've been discussing in the last half hour tend to potentially have uh, an impact on sort of usage and preference um, at least as we've uh, uncovered it in this first piece of research. And lastly, and this is very, again, rudimentary at this point. We haven't published this. We're kind of just uh, geeking out on the data a little bit. But um, we started to develop an Athena ranking schema, um, looking at those typologies and trying to apply um, a score against the brands that we have in the BAV data. And we kind of went through the same process. I'll I'll kind of go past this uh, real quickly to go to the list. But it was sort of interesting. The first pass on the, the top 50 Athenas, one of the first things that jump out, as you can see, are brands that are very much um, NGOs that are charitable, that are focused on human values like Meals on Wheels, Make-A-Wish, St. Jude, Mayo Clinic, um, health and healing brands, brands that are about children, uh, brands that are, are about um, you know, uh, Sesame Street or, or skewing toward women. But just for us, it was so interesting how many of the, um, the NGO brands sort of jumped to the top of this list. Um, but then also, you know, you kind of see a few outliers. You've got the U.S. Army at 21, and I still struggle to understand that. Um, some folks on my team have suggested the U.S. Army is, the, is, I think, the largest employer of women in the United States. So maybe as an inclusive environment, that might explain it. But um, you know, maybe it's an outlier. But, you know, other interesting companies in here, you know, Johnson & Johnson, Lego, Etsy, um, you know, Starbucks, and, and uh, maybe despite the New York Times report <laughs> on Sunday, but Amazon is up there. Um, and so, you know, we, we're just interested in, in understanding um, these approaches and how we might uh, start to think more about the role of, of feminine values sort of within the marketing context as we think about brands and we think about our creative briefs. But I guess as I pull out and conclude, um, really what we are talking about um, is this belief that you know, we're in an open, social, interdependent environment. We're in an environment now where leaders need to possess um, far more nuanced set of uh, qualities rather than simply aggression and command and control. And that's a reflection of, of being in this very open, transparent world. And so, we really talk about it this way. I mean, we feel that feminine values are the operating system of the 21st century. And the more that we can model those values as men and women, obviously, and most importantly, we can champion uh, the role of women as our colleagues, as leaders, um, redressing the, the serious imbalance that, that we know exists uh, as women um, leaders in, in both politics and in business on boards. Um, but also importantly, we create a foundation for future leaders where young men and women are going to, to come up and perhaps not conform to the 20th century models, but to start to create their own path. And that's really why um, we support both Barnard College and the Athena Center 
and also the United Nations Foundation Girl Up campaign where we donated all proceeds of our book. And um, we're working closely with both these institutions to design uh, programs, formats, symposiums, and, and education that will hope, hopefully address uh, the power of creating uh, more women leaders by minting them early on in their lives and, and shaping them as they move forward. So with that, I guess, um, Earl, um, I'll stop and open up for any questions, but uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Thanks, John. That's great. Uh, I just want to remind the audience that if you want to send a question, use the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. Um, and I do have some questions. First of all, I, I want to comment. I think it's um, a credit to you and your co-author, as you say, you didn't start out with a thesis or an agenda of, uh, and then find the data to prove it. This was truly an example of sort of bottom-up leadership, if you will. You, you derived these insights from an amazing amount of research, and it looks like it was a lot of fun along the way as well. Some of those uh, human interest stories that you shared, really great. Um, I have a question about the, um, the range of the, the uh, countries included, for example. They, they tended to be, and maybe for good reasons, uh, more developed countries. And I'm wondering if the notion of the more feminine uh, decision-making styles uh, that you discovered, um, is that something that emerges as a function of economic development? You know, you have something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs that if you're basically just trying to survive, you don't have time to worry about a lot of other things, but as you become more secure in your basic necessities, then you can sort of move to higher values. And I'm wondering if there's kind of an economic development trajectory that explains this, and I have another question related to that in a moment, but just your thoughts about what is sort of driving this uh, phenomenon. John, did we lose you? Oh, sorry, Earl. Um, yeah. No, I, I think what's fascinating about this to us, we expected that thesis going in, and what we ended up finding was that um, ultimately it was the fast-growing markets where we found the Athena values most present, and that was in places like Kenya and Colombia, many of the places where we didn't collect data, but we, we did our interviews. So these are more qualitative um, assessments, but I, I guess I took two points on that. One was um, was that in these environments where there was sort of rapid growth and, and lots of social change, there tended to be sort of more progressive attitudes. And, um, you know, surprisingly for us, I didn't get a chance to go through all the countries, but Colombia uh, was a highly dynamic country where there were some incredible um, women leaders being, being built out of there. So, yeah, I don't necessarily follow the Maslow's piece. I actually think that a number of these um, leaders are actually having the oxygen of a, of a different environment because things are changing so fast that they're um, enabling themselves to, to maybe um, think beyond sort of the, the masculine construct. Okay, that's great. And that leads to the second question, which I think maybe is where you're headed. And, and several of your examples uh, were of the use of technology, social media, and so forth to really uh, do the sort of bottom-up leadership that you gave examples of to connect with people. And I'm, I'm just wondering your thoughts about the role of technology and again making it not only possible but maybe even necessary that, that we shift more towards this style of decision making. It seems a lot of it does have to do with the technology that's come online in the last few years. Absolutely. We, we kind of saw four major factors sort of as the oxygen for the, for the Athena Doctrine. You know, technology being one, millennial values, uh, globalization, and, and lastly sort of this um, post-crisis mentality where there was a lot of suspect against the existing structures. But I, honestly, technology and all the stories I've just shared, many of these um, leaders would not have the success without the technology, right? Ayad Maddish and, and his collaborative uh, doctor uh, program, you know, all these things I think are, are really fueled by technology. Uh, I have a methodological question from a member of the audience, and that is, uh, how were the brands evaluated in terms of the uh, uh, traits that you talked about, the masculine and feminine traits? Could you just tell us a little bit more about how you got the brand evaluations to do some of that uh, analysis that you reported uh, towards the end of your presentation? Sure. Yeah, Monique, what we did is we went back into our brand database, brand asset evaluator, and you can learn more about it at um, bavconsulting.com or reach out to me, but um, basically we have a model where we have 48 uh, brand imagery attributes that we've tracked since 1993, 
and we've developed different factors that then we go back to tie back to understanding how they move our pillars. And our four pillars are differentiation, relevance, esteem, and knowledge. And they then tie back to other measures around usage and preference and loyalty. But we kind of start at that granular level with the, the factors of the different attributes. And what our colleagues at Princeton did is they looked at the characteristics from our research, which was a, a solely separate piece of research, and tried to approximate those to our BAV model, our imagery attributes, um, to develop that typology. And we're, we're still working on it, but we think that there's some interesting aspects to taking um, you know, brand, brand imagery and trying to understand it through that lens. That suggests that you could actually do a kind of a trend analysis since uh, 1990 or so. Have, have you been able to do that or thought of seeing a, a brands presenting themselves more in uh, stereotypically feminine traits or, or sort of projecting that empathy more over time? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. My colleague, uh, Ann, Ann Rivers, um, who I know you know, Earl, who's yes. doing a lot of really interesting research here, um, kind of pulling out um, trends over time. But you know, we, we love our factors because they allow us to take baskets of brands on certain imagery attributes. Uh, we've just done a big um, ex exploration into what drives trust today and how trust is changing uh, by, by using that very method. Um, but yeah, I think as, as we think about it with our uh, Athena data, I'll, I'll definitely take a look at that. Great. That's something to look forward to. Uh, you mentioned in passing, and I maybe want to elaborate on this a bit, that this move towards a more empathetic, open, vulnerable uh, leadership style um, also opens you up perhaps to better insights uh, about your customer needs, uh, innovation. You gave a great example of the uh, gentleman at MIT who's really trying to get his uh, folks to experience what, it, what it's like to be an older adult, you know, trying to navigate through the world. Um, a little bit more maybe about how uh, this style of leadership and decision making is going to perhaps uh, facilitate innovation in the future. Yeah, well, I think first and foremost it's um, working with millennials. You know, here at BAV, Ann and I both work with uh, a bunch of kids, we're out on an open floor, and I, I tell you, I learn stuff every day by simply being close to, to my colleagues and, and sort of uh, latching on to their values and their attitudes and the way they see the world. But um, what I think was really interesting in this connection between empathy and innovation is moving kind of, I guess Tom Stoppard, the play, talked about the fourth wall, but moving through that fourth wall where you're actually not just observing, but you're really living the experience of, of your customers. And so uh, that was an absolute trend in the success of these Athena thinkers is that, interestingly, Earl, many of them had already achieved great success. Uh, Mattish had already sold a company before he started ResearchGate. You know, um, Oren Berger Johnson was a highly celebrated author and satirist in the country. And yet they, they took on these challenges even though they may uh, have created failures. And I think that's a difference uh, in, this, in this new environment is this openness and willing to, to have humility and to, uh, you know, to be open to failure. And I think this connection to empathy and innovation to me gets really exciting because then it allows you to sort of really experiment and, and go deeper into creating better ex brand experiences with your customers. And I think that's the exciting part. Um, and one last question, I would like you to maybe turn the, the lens around and, and say, you know, a lot of the uh, folks on, in the audience listening in and who will be viewing this, uh, you know, uh, once we've archived on our website, um, are not necessarily the leaders of their teams. They're team members, they're the more followers, if you will. Um, what are some of the implications for this shift towards the style of decision making for those who are not, maybe not yet in a leadership position? Um, how does it make their world different or better or, or maybe some challenges involved there? Yeah, I think, well, the first thing is be really open about your strengths and equally be open about your weaknesses and, and create that solidarity with your colleagues in a way that you celebrate each other's talents and, and really work together. I mean, I think that increasingly careers are going to be um, sort of collective constructs um, rather than individual ones. And uh, I was curious to note the, um, the final tally of your survey. I, I candidly answered your question uh, as being more intuitive rather than analytical and intuitive. 
because I said if I'm going to be brutally honest with myself, I started I started in the intuitive side of the world, and I've I've learned my analytics. But you know, I think that's a great example of like I I highly seek out analytic firepower, and my colleagues like Ann Rivers and Anna Johnson and other folks uh, in my group. But um, you know, that's one aspect. I think the other aspect is. Um, is really, we saw this in all our Athena thinkers, they brought their whole selves to work, right? They weren't one person as fathers, mothers, wives, husbands, partners, they, and then a different person at work. And I think that's what companies desperately need today because companies need to be authentic and authenticity comes from your people. So, you know, the less that we can get rid of the corporate speak and put all the pressure on the management to decide the course of the company, I mean, the best run companies have their people out front really for being their authenticity. Uh, that's great. Uh, on your point about bringing your whole self to the job, um, I bet some of the mothers in the audience weren't terribly surprised by the Israeli general that you interviewed who said that that <laughs> was, was her real uh, heads up on strategic thinking and conflict resolution and so forth. I, I think it comes with the territory. Um, so uh, thanks again, John. This has really been a very interesting talk, stimulating talk, and again for members of the audience and for your colleagues who weren't able to join us, uh, this will be archived on our website. If you go to the homepage, page, uh, msi.org, and the video link that is open to both members and non-members, so feel free to go uh, share this with your colleagues. Um, and the uh, presentation itself will be av available for download, and John has given you his contact information if you'd like to follow up individually or check out any of the organizations that he mentions that he's involved in. So thanks again to John. I want to mention to the audience that our next webinar will be September 23rd with Dominic Mike Hansen. As many of you know, a former executive director of MSI. Uh, he's at UCLA. Uh, he'll be talking about empirical generalizations and marketing impact. It's uh, a kind of a video version of the new uh, book that we have out on that topic that Mike has edited for us. So be sure to mark your calendars for that date and plan to join us again. Thanks again, John, and uh, have a good day. Cheers, Earl.